beautiful song, hey? Beautiful prayer. Now, um, Matt, the bass player, was just asking me uh, what I do to refresh myself uh, and uh, spend time with my family. Uh, we had a good game of golf. Michael and I, Michael's the chairman of our elder board, is that Michael and I, every year around this time, we have a good game of golf. We'll try to play golf. <laughs> And I also do a lot of reading and prayer, spend a lot of time in God's presence and a lot of time reading. One of the things I was reading uh, was this, uh, this piece by a Puritan called Thomas Boston called, called The Art of Man Fishing. It was written, get this, in 1699, so written 300 years ago. And this is how he, he, he starts. He says, Lord, who hath believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This day seems to be a day of darkness and gloomless. The glory is departed even from the threshold of the temple. We may call the ordinances Ichabod and name the faithful preachers of Scotland no more Naomi, but Mara, for the Lord deals bitterly with them, in so much forsaking the ordinances in this day. He was really like uh, just decrying or, or speaking about the lack of conversion growth in the church at Scotland. And I love how they use those biblical images. We no longer shall call the preachers Naomi, but we will call them Mara, bitter. That's it, from Ruth, bitter woman. Uh, Naomi asks her name to be changed to. But he actually talks later on about, and, and this is a part that I highlighted. He says, when you get up to preach, you should always say this, O oh, my soul, see that this is God's business. A man may preach as an angel and yet be useless. If Christ withdraw his presence, all will be to no avail. If the master of the house be away, the household will loathe their food. You see, what we need today and what you need today is a work of God's spirit working through the word of God. Let me just pray for God to do that. Father, as we come, in your presence now. Unless you build the house, the labor is labor in vain. If you're not present in this preaching, then everything that I say will fall to the ground. But out of the goodness, your goodness, would you please, and out of a desire for your people to be built up, Father, would you please attend your word now with power, with power of the Spirit. So it not just comes in word only, but it comes with, spirit, with spiritual power and great conviction for the glory of Christ and for the joy and happiness of your people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the new year is always a great time for new beginnings, isn't it? Traditionally, people around this time, they make New Year's resolutions. Uh, they determine that things in their life are going to be different uh, like some people determine I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to get healthy or maybe kick a bad habit. But if you've been around for any length of time, you will know that typically, I don't know if this happens for you, but this happens for me, that the resolutions, resolutions that I make in January, by February, I'm starting to forget, and then by March, are completely forgotten. And so if you're anything like me, you can become very suspicious about making resolutions and even very suspicious about the whole idea that change is even possible. Maybe that's where some of you are today. You've tried over and over again to change things in your life, and as of yet, you've had no real success. You know, your life doesn't look that much different now than what it did in 2016 and 2017. And so you wonder, as you look forward to 2019, will things be any different? But nevertheless, when you read the Bible, the life that Jesus calls us into as believers is a life of change, is a life of growth. Part of what the Spirit does in coming into our lives is He's seeking to change us to look like Jesus, to change the way we relate, the way we think, the way we speak, so that we will relate, we will speak, we will, we will think like Jesus. And so at least I think most of us here could say, yes, we give assent to the theory, the theory that we are supposed to change, that we are supposed to grow, that we are supposed to be different. So in thinking about this series, Resolved, which is what we're going to be doing over the next four weeks, I was thinking, how can I make this series not just a, 
a theoretical series where we tick it off and we go, yes, I agree with that in theory, but how can I make this really practical? So at the end of this series, you are thinking about and making changes in your life. How can I make this series more than just a pep talk where we get together on Sunday and we give each other a pat on the back and encourage each other firmly to grow, but nothing really happens? Now, if you've been with us through um, last year, what we were studying on Sunday morning is we're studying the letter of Ephesians. And as I was thinking about this series resolved, I was thinking, what I, what, what I was going to do is I was going to just use the next part of the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 5, as the basis of our, as a, of our series. But as I was studying this week, I, I, I realized that what I was doing is it was sort of like I was putting a, a, round, a, a square peg into a round hole. I was trying to make Ephesians fit my ideas. And that's never good when you're studying the Bible, to be biblically faithful you want to come to the Bible and let the Bible speak its ideas and change you. And so rather than doing that, what I'm, what I'm going to do is for the next couple of months, we're going to put a pause, or well, the next month, we're going to put a pause on Ephesians. We'll come back to Ephesians in February and hopefully finish it off in March. But what I did this week as I sat in my office and I considered the breadth of biblical teaching on change, I, was, I thought, what is a biblical model for change? What are the pieces that need to come together so that people will change? What is a biblical model for change? And so what I want to invite you to do now is to just come into my office and I'm going to show you this biblical model for change that I, that I was thinking about this week. So here we go. So all change, I think, begins... And Lou, you'll like this because it's Lou here. This is like a, this is like a formula, all right? And I know you like formulas. So... Um, this is a bit of a formula for all those engineers. So biblical change begins, I think, with the work of the Spirit. We can't change ourselves. It actually takes a work of God's Spirit through the instrumentality of the Word to actually change us. So it begins with the Holy Spirit bringing about or, or bringing us to a point of change. Then... Change, if we're going to change, we need to respond to change with faith and repentance. It's no good the Spirit just speaking to you and bringing about this change unless you respond and receive by faith what the Spirit is saying and then act in obedience to what the Spirit is saying through the Word. So you need to activate it through faith. You change through faith. But then... Thirdly, in order to change, we also need, and you're probably not going to like this word, but it's an important word in change, we need discipline. Discipline to walk the pathway of change. In the Bible, there are these spiritual disciplines, these means of grace that actually help put us in a place that strengthens our faith. Things like Bible study, prayer, corporate worship, serving, evangelism. These things are disciplines or disciplines of grace or the means of grace that help strengthen our faith and our resolve so that we will walk the pathway of change. Just imagine for a moment that you've been out running. We, went, we ran two park runs on New Year's Day. It's amazing. It was really hot, actually. And um, by the end of the second one, I was really puffed out. Park run is a 5K run. And uh, I was really puffed out and really thirsty. Imagine after, if you ran a, a huge race, and afterwards all you had in your cup was only a few drops of water. You wouldn't be able to quench your thirst, would you, from that? Now, in order to quench your thirst, you need like a whole cup of water. And this is what the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines do. They fill the reserves of our soul so that we don't run out of steam because we're all going to go through those moments of tiredness. And then all the time, this is lived out in community, in the church, as we be the church to one another in relationship. So it's in the community of God's people that we actually hear the voice of the Spirit often through the Word of God or at a real life group or a Christian friend shares with us a verse and, and, and God uses that to really wake us up. 
And then it's in the community that our faith in God is actually nurtured and grown. And it's in the community that we are disciplined by God's people, that, that we are held accountable for our growth and people speak truth into our lives. I mean, who loved it right there when I, when I told you all that you need to come to church on time? That was really lovely, wasn't it? You really loved that, didn't you? <laughs> That's part of the discipline of being part of a, of a church community is that we speak the truth to each other. And so you change, I think, change is brought about as a work of God's Spirit uh, through the Word, bringing us to a point of decision, of resolution. It's, we respond in faith and obedience. We support that faith and obedience through discipline. And all the while, we're living in community. Now, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, why don't we change? Why don't I change? Why don't, sometimes I don't change? Well, I was thinking, what's the opposite of the spirit? The opposite of the spirit is what? Flesh in the Bible. Oftentimes, the reason that we don't change is rather than our resolution being birthed by the Spirit, it actually is just a work of our flesh. It's just a decision of our flesh. And if it's a decision of our flesh, then the motive for change won't be the right one. All true Christian change, the motive should be that we are going to glorify God with our life and we're going to enjoy Him. But oftentimes, our motive, our fleshly motive for change is just something to do with our idolatry. Take, for example, when most people around this time say, I'm going to lose weight for the year. They make a decision to lose weight. Oftentimes, that is just a fleshly decision. They're making that decision to lose weight so that they can look good in front of other people. So it's really just about satisfying the idol of appearance. And rather than like having being empowered by faith and trusting in God, our fleshly decisions are often just powered by our will. And so we're just, we're just providing willpower. And is it any wonder that we run out of steam by February? And then rather than being spiritually disciplined, we're often very lazy so that we're running on empty in our souls and our spirits rather than being filled with God. And rather than living in community, we often live in isolation. You know, you can be living in isolation even while coming to church. You cannot be in true Christian community where you are known and you know where you are loved and you love. You can be living a very isolated Christian life. And so this is why we don't change. We go year after year after year because it's just a work of our flesh, it's empowered by our will, we're lazy, and we're not really engaging in Christian community. So what I want to do, as I said, is over, the, is over January, because as I said, I don't want this just to be a bunch of theory, all right? I don't want this just to be a bunch of theory that you hear and you take in and you go, yes, I theoretically agree with that. But I want it to be real. And so every week we're going to look at one of these things. Today we're going to look at the Spirit. Next week we're going to look at faith. Then the week after that, uh, Pastor Graham is going to look at spiritual disciplines. And then the week after that, we're going to look at community and how that works. So first, let's look at this whole idea that change begins as a work of the Spirit. Some of you here today, will not change yet because you're not ready to change. It takes a work of God's Spirit working in you to bring about change. Now, all throughout the Bible, you will see that God's Spirit, through the instrumentality of the Word, the Word is all important, God's Spirit, through the instrumentality of the Word, will bring God's people to this point where they need to be renewed, where they need to make a decision. Like was read out in Joshua 24. In the book of Joshua, what happened was God's people had gone in to take possession of the land and they'd won mighty victories, seeing the power of God at work. And yet it seems that by the end of the book of Joshua, they're already serving idols. And so Joshua stands up 
and declares to them the Word of God and says, choose this day whom you will serve, whether it be the Lord or whether it be the gods of Canaan. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they all responded and made a resolution now to serve the Lord. You see, what the Spirit will do in bringing about change in your life is the first thing that the Spirit will do is He will show you your need. He will show you your need for change. Because of the blinding effects of sin, because of the powerful influence of the devil who blinds us and deceives us, and because of our own tendency in our flesh to justify our sinful habits and sinful lifestyles, we need the breaking in of God's Spirit to come in and show us the truth of where we really are with God. We need Him to come and reveal to us the truth of where we really are. Now, there is a predictable pattern that we often go through as individuals and that people, the people of God corporately often go through. And I want to show you that now, but I want to just turn the board around. Can you help me, Carl, just to turn the board around? So, Because I'm going to give you another diagram. All right. So, all right. So, remember up here, we'll talk about the Spirit. He shows us the need. All right. Turn in your Bibles to now James chapter 1, all right? James chapter 1. And let's read in verse 13. This is a predictable pattern that we often go through. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God is not the source of temptation or evil. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So there is this predictable pattern. Here we are. We're going along. We're living life in fellowship with God, life and fellowship with God, all right? We're going along, and then all of a sudden, what will happen is we'll be dragged away, it says. By our own desires. What will happen is maybe the world or the flesh or the devil will come and will tempt us, and our desires will kick in and we'll be dragged away and we'll be tempted. Temptation can start from without, from the world or the devil, but usually it's the world and the devil using our flesh, our desires to draw us away from God. And at this point, we have an opportunity to actually turn back to life and fellowship with God. We can actually flee from temptation and turn back to God. We can follow in the words of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, God's way of escape, or James chapter 4. We can submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from us. So often when you are in this situation, when you're in this situation and you feel the burning of temptation within you and your desires are kicking in, run, the Bible says. Flee, run, get out of there. Like Joseph, leave. Then it says, then James says, if you stay there, desire will conceive sin. You'll sin against God. You'll break His will or His word. And that after sin, sin gives birth to death. Death, I think here, is loss of fellowship with God, guilt, shame, and misery. Guilt is an objective thing, but shame is the accompanying feeling that we experience when we have sinned against God. Uh, we feel this sense of, how could I have done this? How could I have sinned against God? And 
People will feel a great sense of shame in their sin. And sin also brings misery into our lives. And different sins have different consequences and different misery. Now, at this sort of point as well, there is another opportunity. God has set it up that we can actually return to him through the mechanism of confession and repentance. By admitting our sin and turning from our sin and turning back to God and receiving his cleansing, we can be restored to life and fellowship with God. And this is a predictable pattern that probably happens all the time in the lives of believers who are walking with God, is you'll be dragged away, you'll be tempted, you'll sin, you'll feel the feelings of guilt, shame, and misery, it'll bring death, you'll then confess and repent, and you'll be restored to life and fellowship with God. That's a predictable pattern that James has just spelt out that happens. But I've also seen something else happen, is what often also can happen is that people, when they get in this position here, instead of turning back to God in confession and repentance, what people can do is they will turn back to sin and seek to cover their guilt and their shame and their misery with more sin. You see, because sin does bring momentary pleasure. There is momentary pleasure in sin, and so what some people do is in order to cover the guilt and the shame and the misery that they're feeling, they turn back to the pleasure of sin again and do more sin to seek to cover their guilt and their shame and their misery. You know, I've seen this work out in the lives of young guys that I've counseled with the sin of pornography. They'll be dragged away and tempted by pornography. They'll sin. Then sin brings with it guilt and shame and misery. But rather than coming and dealing with it through confession and repentance and being restored to life and fellowship with God, they'll go back to pornography, back to sin to cover their guilt and their shame. And when that happens, it leads to this place right here, habitual sin pattern and bondage. This feeling that I just can't get out of this place. I just can't get out of this, this sin that I am trapped in. I want you to turn to Romans 7. Turn over to Romans 7. Romans 7 is technically Paul is speaking of a person who is seeking to be justified by the law. And so it's about living under law. And if you want to know more about that, this year I'll be teaching through the book of Romans on our Monday night equipping first and second term, so you can come along and learn through the book of Romans. But in Romans 7 and verse 15, I think Paul describes a life in bondage to sin. Verse 15, he says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. People who are stuck in this habitual sin pattern and bondage have this, they wonder, why am I doing this? What is going on in my life? For I do not understand my own actions, for I, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. I agree that this is sinful, but it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin that's indwelling me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do not do what I want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find to be this law or principle that when I want to do what is right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another principle waging war against the principle of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? I don't know how many times I've sat with people and they've made that cry in verse 24. Wretched person that I am. Who's going to deliver me from 
this bondage of sin that I am now in, where I no longer actually feel the pains of temptation, but as soon as sin comes knocking, I give in. And I don't want to. I don't desire to. But I'm just in bondage to sin. And then, this gets even worse. If people continue in this state, they can move down further. Now, you're probably not going to be able to see that from back there because I'm not a very good teacher in drawing on the whiteboard. But the word is, it leads to a hardness of heart. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 3 in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day. We need the word of God, the spirit working through the word. As long as it's caught today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You can get into a place where you fall so far down that this becomes your new normal. You have no joy, no intimacy of fellowship with God. The life of fellowship with God is a distant memory. And you become very blasé about your faith, very skeptical of other people. And this hardness of heart is, it can be where, where you now live. It's your new normal. And you see, this is why what the Spirit wants to do is He wants to show you your need. He wants to show you the truth of where you actually are. So where are you on this diagram? Are you here living life in fellowship with God? Have you been dragged away and tempted and you need to come back to Him right now? Are you in a habitual sin pattern? Are you in such, so far down that you've got this hardness of heart so that the Word of God doesn't even penetrate you anymore? It doesn't move you anymore. You see, this pattern not only happens to us personally, but it can happen to the people of God corporately, that the people of God are dragged away from God. They sin against God. They develop habitual sin patterns and they develop hardness of heart. And this is where revival needs to happen so that the fallow ground is broken up so that God can rain righteousness upon it. This is the churches in the book of Ephesus, in the book of Revelation, like the church at Ephesus, which had lost its first love, and the church of Laodicea, which Jesus said, you are lukewarm. I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus said, if the light in you is darkness, then how great is the darkness? I'm fearful for my life and I'm fearful for the church in the West. I'm so fearful for the church in the West because maybe we haven't even seen the truth of how far that we've fallen. How many idols that we worship how the holiness of God in church is not our first priority. Our first priority is entertainment. Church is Christian entertainment. Rather than the holiness of God being on display, His holy character, you shall have no other gods before me, He says. I'm worried that we need renewal. We need a work of God's Spirit to show us the height as Jesus would say, from which we have fallen, to show us the condition and the truth. Now, fortunately, what the Spirit does is He not only shows us our need, but the beautiful thing that He does is He shows us God's grace. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? What does Paul go on to say? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
There is grace for you today. You don't have to live in a habitual sin pattern in bondage. You don't have to live in hardness of heart where you never experience the beauty and joy of life with God. The Westminster Confession says, what are the blessings that flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? They are the blessings of peace in your conscience, an assurance of God's love, and grace upon grace. The Christian life should be a life where you experience more of God's goodness and grace as you walk with Him every day. And the grace of God that's demonstrated through the Spirit is that God doesn't just have grace for your past to forgive you. He doesn't have just have grace to send you to heaven. He's got grace to help you in your present sin struggles. The gospel should make a difference today in your sin struggles. He has grace to help you break that habitual sin pattern. Grace that will help you plow up the hardness of your heart so that you can enjoy intimacy with God again. But as I said, this is all a work of the Spirit. And for it to be genuine, I can't manufacture it by raising my voice. I can't manufacture it by having clever illustrations. It needs to be a genuine work of the Spirit, working through the instrumentality of the Word. But there is, I tell you, one thing that we can do, one thing I think we can do. It's this. It's to humble ourselves. But he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. James 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? But he gives more grace. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that in due time you will be exalted. You can put yourself in a position where you come to God and say, God, Pour out your grace upon me. Show me the truth of who I am. Enable me to confess and repent in the full trust that Jesus' work was sufficient and break this habitual sin pattern in my life. So what I wanted you to do, everybody, is this is the Lord's day today. I want you to go from this place and spend some time with God. Your spiritual life will not be one that can be grown instantaneously. You need to spend time with God if you're going to become mature in God. So I want you to go this afternoon and spend some time with God and maybe open up to like Exodus 20 and read through the Ten Commandments and ask God to search you and bring that conviction of sin into your life. Maybe read through Colossians 3, where Paul talks about setting our minds on things above, not on things of earth, and putting to death the things of this earth, and putting on holiness, and putting on forgiveness, and putting on love. Take some time with God and humble yourself under his mighty hand. And the promise is, in due time, he will exalt you. Let's humble ourselves now corporately before God. This is why this 21 days of prayer that we're calling you to is so important. We need the Spirit to be at work in our church for anything to be effective. Lord, we want to seek you and seek your face while you may be found. Lord, we want to desire you your renown, we want to be the passion of our hearts. Your glory, we want it to be the passion of our hearts. We want the pursuit of you to be our happiness, Lord. So we come as a church family before you. And we acknowledge, Lord, 
that we have often been friends with this world. We acknowledge that we haven't sought you first in our affections and in our imagination. Lord, bring renewal into our church as we seek you. Bring that freshness that only you can bring. That stream of living water, Jesus, that you promised that would flow out of the hearts of all of those who put their trust in you and exalt you in their lives. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Let's stand together.